Good afternoon. My name is Josh Rubner, Director of Government Relations with the Institute for Middle East Understanding. Welcome to this webinar on how the U.S. is planning to build its embassy on stolen Palestinian land in Jerusalem. I want to thank our co-sponsoring organizations for putting together this webinar today. Adala, the Legal Center for Arab Minority Rights in Israel, the Center for Constitutional Rights, Institute for Middle East Understanding, and the Institute for Palestine Studies. Before we jump into our topic today, I think it's important that we acknowledge the very fraught circumstances that we're seeing today in Palestine, Israel. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government is a little more than one month old and is already living up to its characterization as the most extreme Israeli government ever. This government is committed to maintaining and intensifying Israel's brutal settler colonial and apartheid rule over the Palestinian people, denying them human rights and self-determination. This month alone, Israel has killed more than 30 Palestinians, including nine killed during an Israeli attack on the Janine refugee camp last Thursday, an attack in which children and women were killed. Also on Friday, a Palestinian opened fire in an illegal Israeli settlement in East Jerusalem, killing seven Israelis. This loss of life is tragic and sadly won't end until its root cause, Israel's violent settler colonial and apartheid rule comes to an end. Let's be clear, this is a dynamic of occupier versus occupied, oppressor versus oppressed. We see this dynamic playing out in Israel's current push to drive Palestinians from their homes in places like Khan al-Ahmar and Masaf al -Riyota potentially expelling thousands of Palestinians from their homes to further Israel's illegal colonization. We see this dynamic playing out in Israel's ongoing 15 year long siege of the Gaza Strip, which denies more than 2 million Palestinians access to enough food, water, electricity, and medicine. We also see this dynamic playing out in the calls of current Israeli government ministers, to quote, finish the job that was started in 1948 and inflict a second Nakba on the Palestinian people. The Nakba, meaning catastrophe in English, is the term Palestinians use for Israel's expulsion of the vast majority of indigenous inhabitants of the 78% of historic Palestine that became Israel in 1948. During the Nakba, Israel inflicted horrific violence to drive as many Palestinians from their homes, from as much of Palestine as possible. Israel has refused to allow Palestinians to return home and either demolish their villages and towns completely or stole Palestinian homes for Israelis. This year marks 75 years since the Nakba began. Settler colonialism is not a singular event, but a process. And the U.S. is complicit in Israel's ongoing Nakba against the Palestinian people. One of the many ways in which the United States is complicit in this ongoing Nakba is through the Biden administration moving forward with a Trump era plan to build an embassy in Jerusalem on land that Israel stole from Palestinian refugees, including U.S. citizens. Here to inform us about this crucial issue are three esteemed panelists. Dr. Suhad Bashara is the legal director and director of land and planning rights at Adala, where she has worked since 2001. Dr. Bashara is an expert in land rights and dispossession and has more than 20 years of experience litigating cases before the Israeli Supreme Court in major human rights cases regarding Israeli Palestinian citizens of Israel and Palestinians in the occupied territory. She is leading the legal team filing an objection against the US government's plans to build its embassy on Palestinian land. She holds an LLB from Hebrew University of Jerusalem, an LLM in public service, for, uh, public service law from New York University School of Law, and recently received her PhD from King's College School of Law in London, where she teaches human rights law. Dr. Rashid Khalidi is the Edward Said Professor of Arab Studies at Columbia University and is one of the descendants of the original landowners on whose property the, in Jerusalem, the US government seeks to build its embassy. Dr. Khalidi received his BA from Yale 
and his PhD from Oxford University. He has taught at the Lebanese University, the American University of Beirut, Georgetown University, and the University of Chicago as well. He is past president of the Middle East Studies Association and the co-editor of Journal for Palestine, of Palestine Studies. Khalidi is the author of The Hundred Years' War on Palestine, A History of Settler Colonialism and Resistance, 1917 to 2017, Brokers of Deceit, How the U.S. Has Undermined Peace in the Middle East, among many other books and more than 100 scholarly articles. Diala Shamas is a senior staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights, where she works on challenging government and law, law enforcement abuses, perpetrated under the guise of national security in the U.S. and abroad. Diala works at the intersection of surveillance, policing, and immigration, and advises social justice movements as they face suppression efforts at the hands of state and private actors. Diala has also worked on a range of international human rights issues, including in Israeli-occupied Palestinian territory, where she has lived and worked extensively. Diala is a graduate of Yale Law School. The panelists are now going to give some opening remarks in the order in which they were introduced. Suhad, the floor is yours. I think you may be muted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Josh, uh, and uh, all of those who joined us uh, today. I will. Um, in my opening remarks, uh, I will give a very short overview of uh, the legal framework by which Israel uh, has confiscated or stolen properties belonging to the Palestinian refugees, uh, among those internally displaced uh, who became uh, citizens of Israel. Uh, so I will focus on the absentee property law that was enacted in 1950, through which uh, the land uh, the embassy is planned on uh, was uh, confiscated. Now, uh, we are talking about a, a law according to which all Palestinian refugees, regardless of the circumstances, including some internally displaced uh, who became citizens of Israel, as I mentioned, were defined as absentees and their properties uh, were confiscated. Is this an racially uh, contentious law that is considered one, if not the most arbitrary and draconian racially designed law enacted in this regard, that it is based on the sole notion and the logic of conquest. I mean, this is the whole logic behind the law, aiming for the land in an extreme objectification of the Palestinian owners. Uh, we are talking about the law that has no due process, no notification, uh, of course, assumption of good faith on behalf of the Israeli custodian uh, of absentee property. Um, uh, and so we cannot really, there's no way, regardless whether you are a US citizen, European uh, refugee in a refugee camp in the West Bank or a citizen, there's no way to challenge uh, any of the draconian consequences uh, of the law. This is why it's considered so draconian um, in such a way. Um, now, back in the early 50s, and knowing that this policy is and law uh, are very problematic and violates international law, with the enactment of the law, the official position of the State of Israel vis-a-vis uh, -vis the international community was that this law, which was enacted as a direct result of the war, is an emergency law that does not intend to bring to confiscation of the refugees' properties forever. Uh, this position uh, sought to provide some kind of an answer to the development of international law after uh, World War II, when it became clear that confiscating property of war refugees or enemy subjects after the end of the war constituted a flagrant violation of, of the laws of war. Uh, however, handling of these properties by Israel took internally completely the opposite uh, direction. And over the years, Israel's official position uh, has also became uh, clear that these properties are in practice and in theory and under Israeli law definitely expropriated and the state of Israel is entitled to use and treat them as 
the full owner. Uh, now, corresponding with the Israeli Attorney General back in 2009, uh, the office replied that Israel holds full ownership of these properties and the right of the absentees applies to the property's value or price if it's sold. Still a violation or a clear violation of international uh, law. Now, it's important to note that this law is not only a deal of the past. We are here addressing three main issues. One is, first, the refugees problem is still a living problem and not resolved and should be one on the negotiations table, near or far future or whatever uh, in this regard. Two, the law is still uh, used to dig deeper, looking for more properties. And as of today, it is still used as a basis to displace uh, Palestinian families, citizens of Israel from their homes, predominantly in uh, some of the Israeli uh, cities. And three, it still serves as a framework to expand the scope of the Palestinian property confiscated with any expansionist steps taken by Israel. As an example, once uh, East Jerusalem was illegally annexed, the absentee's property law was ready for action and used as a tool to confiscate Palestinian properties in the annexed area. We are mainly predominantly speaking about Palestinians who became refugees as a result of the 67 war, or simply because they live in the West Bank and own property in East uh, Jerusalem. Now, in terms of the scope, there exists no, uh, there, there exists several assessments in this uh, regard, including a detailed survey done by the UNCCP in 64, which concluded that we are talking about over 7 million dunams. Uh, Israeli archival reports reveal that the property vested with the custodian for absentee property was about 4.45 million dunams as of 1954, and we know that this number has uh, increased uh, through the time, again, because the law is activated all the time, continuously, uh, regardless. And again, once you're considered uh, an absentee under the law, you're uh, forever an absentee, and there's no uh, way uh, back. Now, the challenge in the case uh, of the land subject to the U.S. Embassy plan, and, and generally speaking, is how do we prove uh, ownership? Uh, Israel officially does not reveal the scope or location of the properties appropriated under uh, the law belonging to the refugees. And their main argument following correspondence with them that this will or might uh, damage its position in the negotiations with the Palestinians, uh, and it might damage foreign relations uh, of the state. So this is why this remains a big uh, secret within the Israeli uh, authorities vis-a-vis -vis what kind of information they reveal uh, outside. Um, now, uh, approaching Isra Israeli authorities to extract British mandate deeds was not successful in regard to the plot of land that we are talking about. So we decided to have an extensive archival research on the matter, uh, building on the excellent uh, research uh, work that was done years before by Dr. Uh, Walid uh, Khalidi. Uh, and um, we had uh, uh, to try to find documents to prove ownership. This was uh, the goal in order to build a legal framework behind these uh, evidence. So, so an exclusive archival research uh, was done in the Israeli uh, archive, and it revealed that, luckily, <laughs> they inherited a lot of the files documenting the uh, what's called the hiring contracts between the British mandate authorities and the Palestinian landowners, as well as many other official documents to prove ownership. And this is how we, bit by bit, were able to build the puzzle of the landowners with documentation to prove this ownership that we then use to support uh, our legal work on the US embassy uh, plan, including the objection that was submitted uh, yesterday uh, against the plan. And I will be able hopefully to address um, 
later on in, in, in the webinar. So thank you, Josh. Thank you so much, Suhad. Professor Khalidi. You're muted. We've been doing this for three years and we still forget to unmute. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Josh, uh, for that introduction. Thank you, Saad, for that uh, uh, discussion of some of the legal issues. Um, and thanks to everybody who's attending. Uh, I'm very glad to see that issues that are usually buried or, or obscured uh, are being discussed today. Issues like Israel's appropriation of Palestinian land, which is illegal under the Hague Convention, uh, the expropriations, in other words, that Saad Mushada has just discussed. Um, secondly, the status of Jerusalem and U.S. policy on Jerusalem, something that is not fully exposed to the light of day. Uh, thirdly, the plans for the U.S. Embassy on the Allenby site, what we're talking about uh, this afternoon uh, and this evening in Jerusalem. And um, the, 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 the fact that much of the Allenby site is the private property uh, not only of many Palestinians, but of uh, a number of them who are U.S. citizens. Um, Saad has spoken to the 1950 Israeli absentee property law that gave legal cover to Israel's theft of Palestinian land. Let me remind you that Jewish ownership of land in Palestine in 1948 amounted to 7% to 8% of the total. Most of the rest of the land in Palestine, whether land of Palestinians who remained inside Israel or Palestinians who were forced to flee during the ethnic cleansing of 1948. Most of the rest of the land of Palestine outside of that seven or 8% was confiscated under this law of 1950, the Israeli absentee property law. Um, I would suggest that this constitute a form of legalized lawlessness, whereby like other colonial powers uh, after ethnic cleansing, the Israeli state took over, stole, the property uh, of uh, the uh, indigenous population um, and gave it legal cover of this of this 1950 law. And I'm very glad that this that these these issues are being brought out here um, because the tragedy in Palestine is not just the continuing occupation. It's not just the the driving people off of their land in 1960, 1948 and afterwards. It's also the fact that people were stripped of their property, uh, which was taken over and used by Israel uh, under this law. Um, let me talk a little bit about the status of Jerusalem and U.S. policy. Um, back in 1947, when the United Nations General Assembly dealt with the matter of Palestine, uh, under Resolution 181, it called for Jerusalem to be a separate international zone, a corpus separatum. It was not to be part of either the Jewish state to be established under the partition plan or of the Arab state to be established under that plan. Um, and so its status was to remain, as, 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 the, as the partition plan said, international. Um, Israel proceeded to annex uh, Arab East Jerusalem and uh, uh, later on proceeded to move its embassy there. In August 1948, the UN, sorry, in August 1980, the United Nations Security Council condemned Israel's annexation of Jerusalem, condemned its moving of its capital there. Um, and this is a resolution that passed the Security Council with the, with the support, or at least no veto from any permanent member. The United States, in fact, abstained, uh, but allowed that resolution to pass. And so this constitutes another pillar of international law relating to Jerusalem. A third uh, is an international treaty between the United States, Israel, and the PLO, the Oslo Accords, signed in 1993, whereby Jerusalem is described as a final status issue for resolution between the parties. The idea of unilateral actions by either of the parties or by the United States to change the status of Jerusalem is therefore a violation of the Oslo Accords. Um, so the status of Jerusalem is thus clearly subject to provisions of international law and to international treaties, which Israel has violated by moving its capital there and by annexing uh, occupied Arab East Jerusalem. The Biden administration, has, as it has done with almost every other Trump administration policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel and Palestine, the Biden administration has endorsed this Israeli violation of a multiple violation of international law by uh, both recognizing Israel, Jerusalem as Israel's capital and by moving 
uh, the U.S. Embassy there. These are Trump administration policies that, like almost every other policy, uh, the, uh, the Biden administration uh, has maintained uh, other policies on Palestine so and Israel. So what we're talking about here is gross violations uh, of international law by Israel, uh, originally uh, condemned by the United States, uh, which uh, this administration has now cho chosen uh, to green light. Um, <clears throat> let me talk a little bit about plans for the embassy site. Back in the 1990s, the US government initiated plans uh, to build a US embassy on this site. Um, the United States had still not recognized Jerusalem uh, as Israel's capital. It had still not decided to move the embassy. The embassy was at that stage in Tel Aviv. Um, uh, but the planning process began, uh, initiated, I, I, must, I must stress, by the United States government. Uh, at that time, representatives of Palestinian families uh, started research into land ownership uh, of this plot, uh, led, as, as uh, Dr. Bashara mentioned, by uh, Walid al khaldi Professor Walid al khaldi um, This research proved that these families, including my own family, were the legal legal owners of most of the Allenby uh, barracks site. It was formerly a barracks of the British Army, rented to the British government, uh, mandatory government of Palestine, by these families. Um, in 1998, all of this research was forwarded to the U.S. State Department. The State Department soon afterwards acknowledged this, and very soon after that, the plan was shelved. The Trump administration resuscitated this plan, and the Biden administration is pushing forward with it. It is hiding behind a claim that it is waiting for objections to this process, the objection process before the uh, Israeli Planning Commission ended yesterday. Um, we, The families, through our lawyers, um, Adana and, and uh, Center for Constitutional Rights, have uh, registered our objections before the Israeli Planning Commission and sent these objections to the U.S. government to both Secretary Blinken and Ambassador Thomas Nides, the US ambassador to Israel, uh, to date uh, asking for a meeting with them to lay out our concerns uh, as property owners, including a large number of US citizens. Uh, there are four US citizens mentioned, in fact, in the planning objection and in our memo produced by uh, Adana and the, the CCR. To date, uh, the US government has not uh, acknowledged our request for a meeting or agreed to a meeting, uh, instead pretending that this is an Israeli planning process and we have to wait for the Israeli uh, uh, government uh, planning commission to uh, complete its work. Uh, these, this is property owned by U.S. citizens being taken by a foreign government, which the U.S. government refuses to address directly, instead demanding that we go through a biased, crooked, uh, uh, legalized lawlessness of Israeli law and Israeli planning, which is designed to take over Palestinian land and transform Palestine into the land of Israel. In the words of one of the leading figures in early Zionism, Zeb Jabotinsky, that's what it was always about, transforming Palestine into the land of Israel. Um, my family is one of a number of families uh, whose property was thus confiscated and which now is, is proposed uh, to turn into the US embassy in Jerusalem. Uh, many of these families are represented in the action by IDATA and by the CCR. And as I mentioned, four of these are, are US citizens. There are others, but these are the four who have produced affidavits and uh, given, given IDATA power of attorney. So uh, to conclude, we are talking about a situation in which the US government proposes to build its embassy in Jerusalem, a city uh, which under international law, it should not be doing on land illegally confiscated from US citizens and other Palestinians. Uh, does the United States propose thereby to endorse Israel's theft of Palestinian land? Does the US government thereby propose to endorse Israel's theft of the land of US citizens? If these were US citizens anywhere else, I think we would have a different answer to that question. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Rashid. And I'd be curious to hear Tom Nye's answer and Tony Blinken's answer to your questions. Uh, Diala, over to you. Thank you, Josh. Um, and uh, thanks, IMU, and everybody who's put in the work to organize this event. It's really an honor to be here and also always a challenge to go after Rashid and Sohad. 
Um, I will try to not be redundant, um, but highlight, a, highlight a, a few points and add some context also here. Um, of course, the focus of this webinar is, you know, this particular site and the choice of the site. Um, and both Suhad and Rashid, as well as um, those who came before them, Dr. Walid Khaldi and, um, and, and others who've been able to do this deep archival research um, show that what, frankly, the story is really emblematic of um, most parts of Jerusalem and all of historic Palestine, any, under any surface you scratch, whether it's through digging archives or through freedom of information requests or through family memory, you're ultimately landing on a story of dispossession. And so the story here of um, the United States' embassy, the location and the site is really sort of emblematic of this broader problem. So while um, the move of the embassy to this particular site is problematic for many of the reasons that they've already laid out, um, wherever it, I just wanna kind of underscore that regardless of where um, an embassy is located in Jerusalem, it is also illegal. And so I just wanna kind of start there and, and underscore that point. So first and foremost, as um, Rashid laid out, is a violation of the corpus separatum principle in international law. So that is basically the international law designator or framework for Jerusalem for the past 70 years, since 1947, which is a partition plan date. And in one fell swoop in 27, the Trump administration, uh, 2017, I believe, uh, yes, the Trump administration broke those 70 years of international consensus. Um, and, you know, of course, Palestinians have plenty of bones to pick with the partition plan, um, the partitioning of Palestine in 1947. And this goes back to the core identification of the Zionist project with the colonial project at the time. But Jerusalem as corpus separatum has been a red line by the international community. It has been a fundamental pillar of international law regarding Jerusalem. Since 1948, even though Israel has considered and behaved in Jerusalem as if, as if it were a sovereign um, and not just an administrator, the international community did not recognize it, it did not recognize its sovereignty over Jerusalem. This is why every state had its embassy to Israel situated in Tel Aviv, not Jerusalem. So the idea was that Jerusalem would remain this corpus separatum until, you know, ultimately there would be some negotiated agreement or would remain under a sort of international, um, a sort of international city. This was such a central feature that despite successive US presidential campaign promises to move the embassy for votes, um, none ever did it when it came to it. They kept kind of extending, you know, this, through this waiver process, which we could get into later. Um, so, you know, I think, and, and that of course ended when Trump finally made good on his campaign promises as, as he did on several campaign promises. Um, but so when, you know, the Biden administration talks about a rules-based international order um, and, you know, bringing back international law as, a, as, a, as a something that the US administration is sort of leading on, um, we have to actually point to the, to the evident fact with this move, with Trump administration's signature move, um, we're actually leading in the erosion of those rules. So since we've moved our embassy to Jerusalem, other states have followed suit. There are now four other states with embassies in Jerusalem. I think it's Guatemala, Honduras, and Kosovo. Uh, this was, you know, the signature move. Um, it's also of, of the Trump administration, um, like the Muslim ban and others. It's also one of the few that the Biden administration has wholeheartedly, full-throatedly endorsed um, and embraced, right? It's not like the others where even though many of us have concerns under, you know, whether you're talking about immigration or other, you know, Trump administration policies where we see a lot of continuity across administrations. This one is, I think, the only one that I can point to where in rhetoric, there's also full-throated endorsement. Um, and I, I should just note one more thing on, on the sort of look, the move in general to Jerusalem. It is also a breach of US obligations under the Vienna Convention. Um, the Vienna Convention basically says that a state can't place its diplomatic mission uh, in another, to an, the, its diplomatic mission to another state in territory where that other state is not sovereign. So to be clear in moving the US embassy 
to Jerusalem, the United States is apparently recognizing Israeli sovereignty over Jerusalem, again, in, in violation of this sort of fundamental corpus separatum principle. Um, this verse not further entrenched through an expansion or a move to a new site. Um, and and if, frankly, if this is not what the US administration is saying with this move, then it needs to tell us that it's not. And that's part of what you know we've we've hoped to have um, kind of what we hope to hear from them in a meeting, which we requested when the Adala and Center for Constitutional Rights um, wrote that letter many months ago, requesting a meeting, which we have yet to be able to get. And I just want to say one thing about, um, you know, adding to this absentee property discussion and the implications of the specific location of the embassy, of course, um, in expanding it on this particular site, we're not only adding insult to injury, which is, you know, illegality to illegality, um, but in moving it to this particular site over the objection of the Palestinian heirs, including uh, United States citizens, the, uh, the, or in signing, even on the original signing of the lease, which I believe happened a couple of decades ago, uh, the US is giving effect to that law. And I think that both Rashid and Suhad said this, but it's worth underscoring. It is assuming that the law is valid, um, that systematic and discriminatory seizure of Palestinian refugee property is valid, that transactions with that stolen property are valid. So if anything, the US as a matter of domestic and foreign law and policy has recognized the primacy, primacy of private, private property, right? This is the one thing that we all kind of know that the US is really, um, really feels very strongly about and has you know, put a sort of a red line in, in, in as it's a fundamental feature of our legal system. Um, but here, if the US does go forward with, with um, the construction or just with the plan, it will be signaling that Israel can extinguish Palestinian private property rights, including the private property of US citizens. That's what it looks like. Again, we uh, have asked for a meeting. We've asked for the United States to clarify what it is doing uh, with this site, what it is communicating about the status of Palestinian private property, of refugee property. Um, we, uh, we would love to be proven wrong, but for all intents and purposes, this is what we are seeing. We're heard anything to the opposite. And so we must assume that that is what the United States is communicating to the Palestinian people, as well as to the heirs and to the United States citizens who are also heirs of that property. And then just the last thing, and I'll stop here, um, is, uh, uh, is the other like sort of elephant in the room, which is the sort of broader context. So this expansion or this move, whatever you might wanna call it is happening, not in a vacuum, but in also a context where the United States has, um, has not done anything in, uh, in terms of seeking accountability for U uh, Israel's repeated uh, illegal actions. Even at a baseline when those actions have involved the rights um, or the lives of US citizens. So today, Secretary Blinken is in Ramallah speaking about the peace process and restoring calm, um, meeting with Palestinians in the private sector, side sidestepping Palestinian civil society and human rights advocates. And as far as I can tell, not even mentioning items that are high on the Palestinian human rights agenda. Um, just a few examples that directly implicate US uh, interests. Um, think about uh, the, the, Department of, the Department of State has continued to offer no uh, modicum of accountability, not even lip service for the murder of Palestinian Americans by Israeli forces. And I'm referring to um, two prominent cases here, the murder of Shireen Abu Akhle, a prominent Palestinian journalist who is also a US citizen, and Mr. Osama Assad. To date, the Biden administration and the DOS um, have only evaded questions of responsibility at best um, and parroted Israeli justifications. At the same time, we've seen um, Ambassador Nide's gesture towards moves towards a US visa waiver program granting Israeli citizens visa, visa list travel to the United States, um, despite the fact that Palestinian Americans have repeatedly raised concerns about Israel's continued discrimination at the border um, against uh, US citizens of Palestinian descent who are denied entry to historic Palestine. 
and even frankly to the West Bank, including family reunification. So in this broader context of impunity, the US embassy entrenchment makes it clear that this rules-based rhetoric is empty. Um, perhaps the construction of a, of a US embassy on the actual site of Palestinian private property where the heirs have come forward over the landowner's objections is the embodiment of US policy and signals to Palestinians that they cannot expect anything more from this administration. So again, we hope to be proven wrong. We continue to hope to have these meetings and these conversations with this administration um, and, and are waiting for those responses. Thank you so much, Diala, and thanks to all of our panelists for the really excellent opening remarks. I'm going to take the uh, moderator's prerogative to ask a follow-up of each panelist and um, have them speak within uh, one, one to two minutes in response, and then we'll go to the participants' questions. Um, Suhad, I want to follow up with you first. So the, the objection was filed yesterday by Adala. Can you walk us through some of the legal arguments that Adala used in this um, filing within the context of both Israeli law uh, and international law. And can you talk to us about what, if any, are the special implications of having U.S. citizens named in this objection? You're muted. Yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I want to address uh, two, maybe three, depends on the time, uh, <clears throat> issues or remarks in this uh, regard. Uh, first, that the objection was filed both Israeli authorities and U.S. The administration, that is the U.S. Embassy and the Secretary of State. Now, why the U.S. Embassy, since we're talking about uh, Israeli law and so on, uh, for the simple reason because we are talking about establishing a U.S. diplomatic premises. These premises are sort of uh, sovereign territory of, of the U.S., and the U.S. bears the responsibility in this regard on all levels, uh, on um, terms of law, including international law, uh, and how to run uh, this uh, premise. So, so the U.S. cannot hide, hide behind the claim of Israeli formal procedures, regardless how these procedures uh, are formed. So, uh, so this is why we decided to file the objection officially also uh, for uh, the U.S. administration. The U.S. embassy was among the initiators of the plan. Uh, the U.S. State Department submitted its plans uh, for the compound, took part in the discussions on the plan within the Israeli planning authorities, so on and so on. So we're, they were integral part of how this compound would look like, why there, and so on. So And Israel obviously has a political interest in approving and moving forward with the plan as soon as possible. Israel made its decision. And the final decision in this regard, I think, was and remains in the hands of the U.S. administration. Now, one of the main arguments in the objection that was filed uh, yesterday was that moving forward with the plan and building the U.S. embassy uh, on it would violate international law. Uh, it is contrary to provisions of IHL, international humanitarian law, specifically uh, the Hague regulations that were clearly part of the customary international law post-World War II, since we're talking about refugees properties that were confiscated after the Nakba, these establish a very clear obligation to respect the right of private property and expressly prohibit final expropriation of properties after uh, the end of hostilities. Based on this framework, expropriation of Palestinian refugees properties is considered a plunder, which was defined as a war crime at the Nuremberg trials post-World War II in which the U.S. took part. Uh, and, and in fact, some people were convicted in war crimes at Nuremberg trials for selling properties that belong to um, uh, refugees of, of the war. So building the U.S. embassy on this uh, land, the U.S. will definitely risk complicity in, in violation of, of the condition. Thank you so much. Um, Rashid, turning to you, 
I don't know if you saw this <clears throat> happened right before we came on, uh, but as Diallo mentioned, Secretary of State Blinken is wrapping up his tour of Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories today. He met with uh, PA President Mahmoud Abbas, and he talked about the uh, desire of the U.S. to reopen the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem, which is a separate issue from the embassy. I'm wondering if you could talk about the significance of the U.S. consulate uh, in Jerusalem for the Palestinian people and what, if anything, has the Biden administration done about its promise to reopen it? This, this would actually be one of the first times that the Biden administration has done anything at all different from the Trump administration in Palestine or regarding Israel. Um, the Biden administration endorsed the Trump administration's uh, acceptance of the Israeli uh, annexation of the Golan Heights, accepted Israel's annexation of Jerusalem, uh, accepted uh, Israel's move of its capital to Jerusalem, accepted uh, the Trump administration's closure of the PLO mission in Washington, accepted the Trump administration's closure uh, of the U.S. consulate. In every respect, uh, accepted the U.S., the Trump administration's policy of uh, uh, establishing relations between Israel as an, uh, an occupying power oppressing Palestinians with reactionary, conservative, undemocratic Arab regimes, the so-called Abraham Accords. In every respect up to this point, the Trump, the Trump administration's policies have been faithfully followed to a T. And in fact, sometimes with additional brio and, and, uh, and uh, uh, energy by the Biden administration. If in fact, what the Secretary of State you just told me the Secretary of State said in in uh, in Ramallah today uh, pans out. Um, that would be the only time that they will have changed any Trump administration policy on Palestine. The consulate's important because it was always the contact point with Palestinians for U.S. diplomacy. Uh, right now, uh, Palestinians are obliged to go through a U.S. embassy. It's formerly based in Tel Aviv, which is centered on Israel's interests, as is American policy in Palestine and Israel, obviously. Um, but you always had an outpost uh, in the U.S. consulate in East Jerusalem, um, which was a contact point for Palestinians, and which could be presumed to forward Palestinian objections to Washington. Uh, now those things go through a very um, Israel-centered uh, embassy uh, uh, that's just been moved uh, from Tel Aviv to, 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 to Jerusalem. Great, thank you so much. And now is definitely the time to start typing in your questions if you have any, because we're about to field some of them. But before we do, I want to turn to Diala and ask specifically about something that CCR and Adala wrote uh, in their letter to Secretary of State Tony Blinken. Uh, can you walk us through what are the domestic obligations under US law for what the United States is supposed to be doing uh, for its citizens and their property rights. Sure. I mean, it's, um, I don't know that there is a precedent where like a U.S. embassy is being built on U.S. citizen uh, lands elsewhere. Um, but certainly when, in, in terms of the process of uh, leasing, researching uh, a location that the Department of State is considering or contemplating for any diplomatic, uh, for the expansion of any diplomatic facility, there's going to be some basic due diligence, right, that would happen um, in terms of under uncovering, um, whether it's for security purposes or for ensuring that the title is unencumbered and that this is, this is property that, you know, uh, if the state of Israel is claiming it can lease, it is actually, um, you know, able to lease and, and looking at the, one would imagine that that would include an analysis of the international law uh, basis of, or the validity of that um, claim to the property. So all, I guess all of this is to say, I hope um, and imagine that that research was done when the original lease was entered into. And if it was not, um, that it was then subsequently done when the heirs first came forward presenting their claims um, in the late 80s and, and 90s. Um, and then 
we can give the administration the benefit of doubt, records get lost. I doubt that they do, um, but things transition to electronic databases and so on. And that is now again on um, the administration's radar formally through correspondences um, by CCR and Adala to the administration. And then most recently formally from Adala's objection, which you know um, was filed uh, through the avenue of, um, of the Israeli system, but also directly as Esther had mentioned to, to the Department of State. It bears noting though, that the Department of State hasn't created any formal mechanism or outreach for the US citizens who are impacted, who they know have been, are impacted to raise their concerns. And that is something that, um, you know, I can't necessarily cite uh, uh, legal provisions for because of the particularly unusual situation here. But one would imagine once on notice by US citizens who, who are claiming an interest in this property, um, that there would be some sort of formal engagement. So, so having the you know, heirs here like um, the Khalidis and the other families kind of resort to self-help and try to you know, file their concerns and listen and hope that they will get an audience is not um, the appropriate avenue for um, this kind of concern, right? Setting aside the fundamental legal questions, um, international legal questions around the move of the embassy period, um, not just about this location. Private property is, um, is paramount in, in the US legal system. There is evidence and documents here that have come forward and we expect you know, more. Unfortunately, I think the way that a lot of these things work are that if you don't get um, sufficient public pressure um, on the administration and the decision makers, you're not going to like get the agencies to move in the directions that they're supposed to be moving. And that's a big part of what this webinar is about. That's a big part of, I think, the next steps forward. It's continuing to raise this issue and not allow it to just kind of proceed um, uh, w without considerations to the real kind of interests that are at stake here. Thanks so much for that, Diala. So one of the questions that came in was whether the United States has done anything to open up its own process to have its citizens come forward and put put forward objections to this plan. And if not, why hasn't that been done? I don't know if Sahad or others want to take this question. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, thinking uh, about uh, very basic principles of uh, due process and due diligence, and uh, knowing that it is a U.S. administration decision to move and where to move and where to establish this diplomatic compound, there should be, regardless whether uh, of formalities, whether there is a procedure that allows this or not, uh, very basic principles of uh, uh, administrative law that the US administration should allow uh, US citizens who claimed for the violation of their rights under this decision to be heard and then consider these uh, claims seriously uh, before making a final decision uh, on the matter. I do not think it is necessary to have a law that allows such a procedure or uh, uh, any regulations in this regard. It is an essential part of any uh, due process and due diligence in this regard. And if I could just add, Josh, uh, you know, it's even if there is no formal mechanism that they've created here, um, again, they should. And there is clear, you know, um, there are clear obligations that the Department of State, um, as well as consular officers, you know, must or have obligations of protecting the interests of the United States citizens. This is a fundamental principle of what they're doing when they are abroad, right? The interests of US citizens overseas, um, including foreign estates and foreign inheritances, right? Which this, this would be. 
Um, so again, here there, uh, as far as I am aware, has not been any um, any attention paid, despite these kinds of clear obligations. Of course, the Constitution, um, the you know the the uh, foreign property of of citizens who also have sufficient connections to the United States also is also something that you know are constitutionally protected. These are all, you know, there, there's there are various ways in which, you know, if we were having this conversation, we would raise these concerns. But again, here I think the fundamental issue is that they have not created a process or an avenue for this concern, despite having decades of notice. Um, and if they want to ignore those decades of notice, they have very recent, you know, as of at least November, um, concrete information. And that's a great segue into our next question that came in. And we've got a lot of great questions that come in that have come in. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Uh, but a question here, maybe this one is for Rashid. Uh, are the landowners considering uh, legal action uh, against the U.S. government through the U.S. legal system in line with the Fifth Amendment prohibition against taking private property for public use without compensation? Uh, I obviously can't speak for all the landowners. Um, our family owns a fraction of this uh, of this of this property, uh, and there are many many others to be considered. Um, I think I think that where we are right now is we want to allow uh, the objections put forward by Adela and by the Center for Constitutional Rights um, to both work through the Israeli planning process, which we know will rubber stamp whatever the Israeli government and the US government want, but more importantly, through dealing with our government as US citizens um, and see whether the United States government is gonna actually go down this path uh, that Diana and, and Saad have, have, have laid out where basically the US government is endorsing theft of the property of US citizens. So somehow private property is sacrosanct, except when Israel decides to take it from US citizens. I think we wanna see how that plays out. Um, whether there are legal, legal, there is legal rec recourse under the Fifth Amendment or any other uh, provision of U.S. law, I'm not a lawyer. I can't say, um, but I would say certainly all our options will be open, uh, and we're not going to lie down and roll over and play dead. Whatever happens on this issue, whatever the Israeli Planning Commission decides, whatever the Israeli government decides, whatever the U.S. government decides, and they're the they're the key factor. That's the one we should be talking about. Uh, the Israeli government wants to take Palestinian land. It's what it's it's what it's there for. It's not going to change its course. Will the U.S. government go along with this? This is the this is the only question really to be asked, and this is what we should all be uh, concerned about with our congressional representatives, with this administration, um, in, in terms of of law and and propriety and morality. Um, building a U.S. embassy on the private property stolen from Americans, uh, it's 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 indecent. Uh, and people should be saying that loud and clear to the Biden administration, however biased they are in favor of Israel. This is something more important. This is private property, the very basis of the capitalist order. And if they care about anything, one would assume they care about that. Um, they certainly don't care about Palestinian rights on the evidence of U.S. policies in Palestine. But uh, hopefully uh, we, we'll be able to affect them on this. And if not, as I said, all options are open. Thank you. Did any any of the lawyers want to add in on that? No. Okay. Well, that's a good segue into another. We'll take it step by step, Josh. Okay. Uh, well, that's a good segue into the the next question that came in here. So, what would you recommend that we do to raise this issue with our legislators? What did they? What do? What do you think they can do to put an end to this plan to build on stolen Palestinian land? Uh, how can we increase public pressure in general so that this plan doesn't move forward? I mean, I can start by just repeating what I just said. Um, I think there are, for the first time in U.S. history, a number of people in Congress who don't just kowtow every time APEC tells them what to do. For the first time in U.S. history, there's actually a block of legislators who are at least willing to consider the issue of Palestinian rights. And there are many others who I think are probably open-minded on some of these issues, whether they have to do with private property or whether they have to, have to do with issues of equity and equality and justice, uh, or whether they have to do uh, with the idea that the United States is blackening its reputation 
by its one-sidedness. So I would suggest people write to their congressional representatives. I would suggest, especially people who voted for this president, write to him and say, where is your concern for foreign occupation, uh, which is so manifest in the case of Ukraine and so absent? The word occupation wouldn't, couldn't be uttered by a State Department spokesman the other day, would not say that the attack on the Janine refugee camp by the Israeli army, which killed 10 people, including a woman and, and two children, two young people, uh, not, not armed, uh, 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 was in occupied territory. Ukraine, we're hollering at the top of our lungs as a government about occupation and praising resistance to occupation. But in Palestine, all we talk about is Israeli security and terrorism. Well, people should be talking to their representatives and to this administration uh, to get it on a, on a more equitable, uh, fair uh, track. Absolutely. And I would add in that in response to the New York Times op-ed that you wrote about this issue, we did see some tweets from members of Congress like Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib and Congresswoman Betty McCollum uh, calling on the Biden administration to put an end to this plan. So certainly one thing that uh, viewers can do is contact their members of Congress and, and ask them to speak loudly and clearly about this through social media uh, and to send letters to the Biden administration to put an end to this plan as well. Um, I see that we're running very low on time, so unfortunately we're not going to get to uh, go to any uh, additional questions, but I do want to provide each of the panelists with an opportunity to to cover anything that we may have missed that's on their minds that they want to leave the uh, viewers with. Uh, Diala, can we start with you? Sure. I think there's like the uh, one narrow point uh, in terms of other things folks can do. I believe that the there's also the you know call your call your representatives absolutely. Um, there's also other U.S. actors that are involved in this protected protected plan. A Chicago-based architecture firm has been commissioned to come up and drop the plans. Um, and so, you know, um, I think a conversation that can be had within the profession around um, what are the ethical and professional ethics kind of concerns that are raised with actually participating um, through the through planning in um, expropriation uh, of, of private property in this way. But ultimately, you know, the, the, the ask or the demand isn't, you know, scratch this plan and move the embassy to someone else's stolen pro property, right? I think ultimately this is a lens through which to have the broader conversation about um, the, the Jerusalem embassy move and uh, the sort of illegality of, of, of the whole thing, not just this particular uh, tract. Thank you, Diala. And I believe the name of the firm is Kruk and Sexton in Chicago. Uh, Rashid, over to you. Yeah, I, I, as I said at the very beginning, I'm really happy that this panel opened up a number of issues that are buried or obscured in media coverage and in the absurd political discourse around Palestine and Israel in the United States. Um, all of these are really important things that we should be thinking of. The theft of land, uh, the issue of the United States closing off final status issues like Jerusalem. Uh, the United States violating international law, or rather supporting Israel's violations of international law uh, in a situation where the United States is at the top of its lungs talking about an international rules-based uh, order. Where is the rules-based order where the United States supports illegal actions in uh, Palestine and, and Israel? Um, this plan, as, as Deanna said, uh, might be hopefully scotched. Uh, but the land on which the United States chooses to build an embassy in Jerusalem would, first of all, invi involve a violation of, of international law in any case, and secondly, may well um, uh, involve a violation of the private property rights of other, other Palestinians. Uh, this is a bigger issue than just a, a piece of land on the Hebron Road uh, in West Jerusalem. Uh, this relates to really major issues that are obscured and, and ignored, and which I'm really glad to have a little light thrown on through, through this panel. Thanks so much, Rashid. Uh, Suhad, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, on a final note, um, maybe uh, again, and you know, zooming out to the principal issue, uh, I mean, Jerusalem was annexed by Israel through a proclamation issued by Ben Gurion in August 2049, like nine months after the UN resolution on the corpus Paratus status of Jerusalem. And then the annexation of what's known as East Jerusalem 67 
um, and, and the notion of the United City of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel reaffirmed again with the guiding principles of, of the current government intending to move forward with further annexations. Uh, with this background, I think the distinction that is a commonly officially made by the US uh, in regard uh, in between the West Jerusalem and the illegally annexed areas following the 67 in relation to the embassy and the recognition of, of Jerusalem in this regard, uh, in light of Israel's position is really artificial. Uh, and de facto supports the legal annexation of Israel's notion and Israel's notion of the United City of, of its capital. And we cannot really make this distinction. And it's like seeing, I don't know, a war crime, closing your eyes and saying, I hide the more problematic part of the equation and, and I work with the, with the other. part. This does not really stand. Thank you so much, Suhad, Rashid, and Diala for your excellent work on this issue and your very important um, conversation today here. We will be uh, posting this online and sending it out to you, and hopefully you can distribute it further uh, and to your members of Congress as well for them to view. So thank you all so much for joining, and we'll see you at the next briefing. Thanks.